Greetings, everyone. We're so glad you could join for this month's installment of the Neon Science Seminar Series. We're supported by the National Science Foundation and operated by Battelle. Our goal with this monthly series of talks is to build community at the intersection of ecology, environmental science, and neon. We're super excited to have Ben Weinstein here to present to us today. But before we turn it over to the speaker, I'm gonna go through a few logistics. We have enabled optional automated closed captioning for today's talk. If you'd like to use this feature, find the CC button in your Zoom menu bar. The webinar will consist of a presentation followed by a Q&A session. As you think of questions, please add them to the Q&A box. We also have a meeting chat, which you're welcome to use to share links for any general observations about the research. Uh, we'll also use that to share links with you, like the links to our science seminars page and some other um, things that might be relevant. But as you think of specific questions related to the talk, please put them in the Q&A area and we'll facilitate a discussion at the end. Uh, there will also be an opportunity to raise your hands and ask questions over audio if you would prefer. NEON welcomes contributions from everyone that shares our values, including unity, creativity, collaboration, excellence, and appreciation. Um, this is all outlined in our NEON code of conduct, which applies to all NEON staff, as well as anyone participating in a NEON event. The full code of conduct is available in a link that I will share here in the chat shortly, and it is also embedded in our NEON Science Seminars webpage. So thank you so much for respecting and celebrating our code of conduct. This talk will be recorded and made available for later viewing on our NEON Science Seminars webpage. Usually we get those recordings up by the end of the week. And lastly, if you have ideas for a talk um, in a future instance of this seminar series, Go ahead and nominate yourself or a colleague today by filling out this form that's linked on the Neon Science Seminars webpage. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bridget Haas to introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Sam. Hi, everyone. For this month's Science Seminar Series, we're pleased to introduce Dr. Ben Weinstein, a research scientist at the University of Florida. Ben received a Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of Richmond and a PhD in ecology and evolution from Stony Brook University. Ben is a quantitative ecologist who works on converting remote sensing data into ecological information. He and his lab at the University of Florida, We Ecology, have been prolific in research using remote, neon remote sensing data, generating large scale models such as tree crown maps of 100 million trees from the neon RGB camera data and a continental scale tree species classification model. He, his lab has also generated a number of open source tools such as Deep Forest, a Python package for training and predicting ecological objects from airborne imagery. We at NEON are very excited to hear Ben share more about his research today. So with that, I'll pass it off to Ben. Thanks. Thanks for that introduction, everyone. I'm gonna share and then just make sure everything look and good. Desktop one right there. And let's make that look good. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about the work we've done over the last few years. Um, I need to start by thanking uh, my whole research team, uh, my bosses, uh, Ethan White and Morgan Ernest, uh, the co-PIs on this NSF grant um, that funded the original part of this work, Stephanie Bowman, Nalina Zare, especially, um, Aditya Singh as well, and a tremendous number of, of researchers uh, who helped me uh, push this project forward. Um, it's too many to thank right now. Uh, we need to thank the National Science Foundation for a macrosystems grant, as well as the World Resources Institute um, for some more recent funding about the exciting uh, Million Trees work that uh, I'll talk about in a little bit towards the end. of the day. So I want to talk today a little bit broadly about um, the last few years worth of work. Um, I won't be going into particular technical depth um, for specific papers because there's simply too much to cover. Um, and so uh, our general challenge today is to think about, within the context of NEON, how we predict the location and characteristics of individual organisms from remote sensing. Um, for this talk, we're going to be talking about airborne remote sensing, and we'll be often thinking about um, trees. But I would say that the essential tenets and the things we've learned uh, apply to many types of organisms and are general um, in a large set of contexts. Uh, 
we have been working for a number of years uh, on tree species detection, classification um, in neon sites. And I urge you to look at individual papers for specific um, and hopefully reproducible results. Um, over the last several years, we've published both data sets, tools, uh, research papers, as well as technical papers um, through some of uh, Dr. Lena Zare's graduate students. Um, and so there's a wealth of publications here to look through. Um, and I won't be tying individual figures usually to individual papers, um, simply because there's, there's just too much to cover. This is sort of the general theme that we're gonna talk about today and sort of the arc of our work, if you will. Um, and so ultimately what we're gonna to move towards are landscape level maps of individual tree segmentations where each bounding box um, for a tree crown is labeled with a species prediction. Um, that's gonna take us quite a bit of time because it frankly was a, a number of steps. Um, when we first started this research program, and I think Stephanie is here, um, uh, can attest to this, uh, we had a certain vision for the aims of this research. And we thought that we were going to move very quickly through this arc. Um, and what we found is that there was a tremendous amount of technical work to be done, um, both within NEON as well as just in John, remote sensing tree ecology in general. And so um, we learned a tremendous amount about where the state of the field is. Um, and I'll share some of those reflections a little bit at the end. So let's start with crown detection, right? Our first task, if we wanna make maps of tree species distributions in neon sites, is we need to locate individual trees. A species uh, tag is the property of an individual tree. It's the ecological and evolutionary unit that we're interested in. And so um, in a very literal sense, what we're trying to do right now is put boxes around trees. Um, we're going to start with a single model, which is tree, and we're going to try to apply that to all neon sites. Many of you are familiar with this work. Um, it's it's pretty old at this point. Um, it's four or five years old now. Um, so I won't belabor it since if anyone has seen me give a talk before, you'll have seen some of these figures. The essential challenge with tree detection is that we lack annotated data. Um, you cannot have enough people sitting there clicking on individual trees. Um, I've done tens of thousands of them myself. Um, and you know we would need a huge number um, of hand annotated imagery to make this happen. So instead, what we tried to think about is partitioning out high quality labels that humans have derived versus low to medium quality labels that we can generate automatically. And so in this sort of training regime, um, we're going to use multiple types of NEON data. On the left-hand side, we'll be using LIDAR data and unsupervised algorithm. Um, we use the one from the LIDAR R package um, that Carlos Silva came up with in 2016. So it's um, very well established and, and, and um, quite well used, but it doesn't produce amazing predictions, right? It creates putative tree locations. But the virtue of this idea is that we can do the left-hand side of this workflow um, you know, millions of times, tens of millions of times, hundreds of millions of times. And frankly, if we wanted to, close to a billion times now, um, I think I generated the other day 800 million uh, putative tree labels for the current neon LIDAR stack. Um, and we don't need to train that much. Um, but this kind of semi-supervision is what underlies how deep forest works. So we use those LIDAR putative locations to drape over the RGB. We're going to then hand annotate uh, a small number of uh, RGB labels for tree locations. And then we're going to overlay them um, and retrain the backbone trained on that LIDAR derived. So it's a combination of sensor fusion, uh, semi-supervision, as well as uh, fine tuning. This usually makes more sense to people as you look at it in, in sort of a, uh, an example. So the first panel here is what a LIDAR um, unsupervised algorithm draped over the RGB looks like. You'll see some over segmentation. And yes, of course, there are little knobs. You can change this, but it has three or four parameters. And so any one knob you change from one set of example imagery, it'll you need to change it for another example imagery. Um, there is no optimal solution here. And so what you'll see is some over segmentation for this particular example. You can then train a deep learning neural network on those segmentations. Remember, these are tens of millions of them um, to get bounding boxes. And you can sort of see the ghost of that over segmentation here. We can then fine tune that neural network uh, using the hand annotations, the high quality data, um, and you get better segmentations as well as greater confidence. Um, so this is the underlying philosophy um, that uh, sort of undergirds uh, deep forest. But I think 
more generally for remote sensing, the utilization of multi-sensor unsupervised data for pre-training um, at super massive scale, I think is an underexplored phenomena. And I can talk more about other places that I see this value um, uh, having uh, enduring use in other use cases. Uh, we wrap that into a uh, Python package uh, called Deep Forest. You know, the funny thing about Deep Forest, and I, I think uh, my boss, Ethan, is here, uh, and we can laugh about this uh, many years later. When we made Deep Forest, I thought I was making a reproducible example for a single paper. I thought I was making a 10 centimeter model for NEON data um, that if another person at NEON wanted to use, they could go and pull that model out. It was not ever conceived of as a global tool for tree segmentation. It was never conceived of as, hey, this is going to be the way that most people get their tree segmentations from RGB data. Um, that's not what we designed it for. That's not what we intended. Uh, we were very committed to open source development and reproducibility. Um, and Deep Forest has had a bit of a life of its own. Um, you know, the development of Deep Forest continues to be this sort of strange thing in my mind because um, it has legs in ways that I don't really fully understand and always know about. Um, just now, just this is a complete anecdote. Five minutes ago, uh, a, a NEON staff member just told me that Cyverse uh, has been teaching a NEON training uh, example uh, or a training uh, lecture using Deep Forest. Um, and again, I've never heard of this. I didn't know that. This uh, represents a pattern we see quite a bit, which is that Deep Forest is being used in ways we had not intended uh, and scales that we had never anticipated. Um, we're at tens of thousands of downloads. Uh, some of those download counts from PyPy, pip install Deep Forest, are so high um, that they're either they're unbelievable or they represent a great need in the open source uh, machine learning community. Um, and so how much time I spend on Deep Forest uh, continues to be sort of an ever-present challenge in my mind. And I welcome feedback, frankly, um, from those of you who are here about if you use Deep Forest, what do you use it for? How do we help it? Please make an issue on the GitHub repo. Please let us know what you do and what you need because um, we're in constant state of like, what should we work on Deep Forest this week? Back to Neon data. Um, when we've used Deep Forest to make tree segmentations, uh, we have to verify them in the field. Um, I didn't see the, the participants list. I don't know if Sarah Graves is here, but Dr. Sarah Graves um, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, has been thinking a lot about this the next few years and taking iPads out to the field and trying to trace on individual crowns. Um, and so I generally sort of peg the accuracy of tree segmentations in deep forest on neon 10 centimeter data at about 70%. I don't get hung up on numbers, uh, particularly for evaluation criteria, because that's 70% on a specific evaluation data set. Um, and frankly, um, there will always be new evaluation data. And so we tend to not uh, obsess about whether it's 73% or 76% or whether your method is 81% accurate. Um, the amount of flux and change in this space means that um, everything is moving so quickly that we can't really tie to any particular evaluation rigor and say Deep Forest will exactly be 74% accurate. Um, but with respect to tree crowns, both drawn by humans on images, as well as humans standing with iPads in the field, um, we believe that it has uh, value. It's not perfect. And frankly, uh, humans are not much more accurate than this. It's very difficult to draw segmentations on RGB imagery. And so at some point we measure at 100% accuracy, but the upper limit is, is not particularly well-known what is true accuracy as possible. Um, we've been expanding this out, um, and the World Resources Institute um, has uh, started funding and, and working with us um, to thinking about how we go from NEON data to non-NEON data and adding um, other types of generalization. Again, because neon, because Deep Forest was not designed specifically for non-NEON data, uh, we weren't anticipating its use in that case. And so we've had to go back and try to collect um, a tremendous amount of data uh, for tree segmentation in all sorts of ecosystems. Uh, we have data now from, I think it's 31 countries, uh, from urban scenes, from boxes, from polygons, from points. Um, so if anyone here has tree segmentation data from airborne uh, uh, perspectives, either stem locations, crown locations, um, we would love to work with you to put this into the Million Trees benchmark to create an open source uh, tool for evaluating and training off of uh, global uh, segmentation models. Uh, 
it's been a really exciting uh, opportunity for me to talk to people both within Neon and outside of Neon about how we move forward um, and uh, use the backbone that was developed at Neon um, for this larger use case. Um, and I would love to talk to all of you about <clears throat> the expectations of data privacy and data security for, for Million Trees. In general, we are um, geospatially anonymizing the data, so making all the points relative to the image origin, so there's no geospatial way for a, a person to use um, those data in other contexts. Um, so they just end up as Cartesian coordinates with respect to the image. So look for Million Trees, uh, probably a first draft, maybe coming out this winter, maybe next spring. Um, and we're hoping for a million tree uh, locations uh, across the world. So that was crown detection and sort of what the, the, the status was there. I'll briefly talk about um, uh, sort of dead status. The foresters don't love when I use the word dead, um, right? For neon data with respect to health status, we're talking about trees that are defoliated during times of leaf on conditions. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean they're dead. It does mean that something has happened to them. Um, for the neon uh, maps that we've created, we've also contributed to deadtrees.earth um, and uh, check that uh, really cool project out from Germany on uh, trying to catalog all the different representations of, of um, dead trees from both uh, airborne and satellite data. And for the visualization I'll show in a second, um, we do have dead tree labels. Um, the confidence scores are not quite believable yet, but uh, I would say that we're somewhere between 90 and 95% confident for defoliated trees during leaf on conditions. Um, there's a lot of really interesting uh, work here to be done. Um, and we've also made the dead tree model open source, um, although that workflow still needs a, a little bit more work. And if anyone's really interested in it, I would love to partner with you and, and, and take it further. Um, Naturally, now that we have boxes and some set of which trees are alive, we would want to apply um, the sort of next step, which is the species prediction avenue. Um, this has taken a number of years to, to get sort of a strong handle of and a number of papers to understand. Um, uh, and I, I will share some general ideas here, but there's still uh, quite a bit of unknown about how we move forward here. So at its core, <clears throat> uh, trees uh, are more differentiable in the uh, non-visible spectrum than they are in the human visible spectrum. I think this is a little sad, honestly, the idea that if you could see out into ultra ultraviolet and infrared, you, as you walk through the forest, you would see a more diverse canopy landscape than we see with just the greens uh, right now. And I think it's really cool to think about. Um, so what we can see here is neon data for the hyperspectral um, uh, bands for three years and three sets of crowns. And what you'll see is there's both within year uh, diversity between crowns as between species, I should say, as well as between year diversity within the same crown. And so we have all this noise we need to deal with um, and different spectral representations. For uh, their rare species, I would say in general, we're very good from species one to eight um, in terms of the abundance curve, the eighth most common species. But once you get to the ninth, 10th, 11th most common species in a landscape, um, the major challenge is simply finding them within the landscape such that we can collect the data to get the spectral representations. Um, people usually want to ask me, like, how many samples do you need? And, you know, it really depends on how rare you are in the landscape, how the tree species, I should say, how different it is from any congeneric species, and also, frankly, whether um, the data are, are clean enough to represent those differentiations. And so... Um, we have a number of challenges we need to face, both the rare species, as well as the fine grained nature of this classification. Um, take our site at, at Ordway Swisher um, in Florida, right? We have this complex group of oaks, um, wherein even botanists spend a lot of time standing by this oak and be like, okay, how close to water are we? What is this leaf shape? Um, and so there's a limit, I think, about of our expectations for what's possible in some of these groups. Um, we know hybridization is, is quite common, for example, in those oak groups. Um, and no one knows, as far as I know, uh, how hybridization, for example, genetic admixture, represents spectral representations for deep learning models. So this kind of interplay between ecology and biology is still really powerful, and a lot is not unknown. Um, in a very literal sense, right, we have field stem data. These are Neon's woody vegetation uh, plots. Um, and we have the species predictions um, for, uh, or so the species observations, I should say, for those uh, data. Then we have deep forest boxes we need to overlay. And we need to understand which pixels in the hyperspec or the RGB in this case, go with the uh, training data and the training label. 
This is not trivial. And I, I want to really stress this. This is probably the largest area of difficulty um, and something that Neon needs to continue to think about how we improve. Connecting the airborne and terrestrial data um, takes a huge amount of work um, because forests are three-dimensional structures. Um, if every tree is uh, beyond 10 centimeters, is labeled within a tree plot, how do we figure out which trees are available for pixels um, in the airborne uh, hyperspectral data, as well as the airborne RGB data. So bringing together multiple data products here, RGB for tree segmentation, hyperspectral for species classification, and terrestrial woody, woody vegetation structure for labels um, is a complex task. Um, we really need to understand sort of how we uh, improve both the data we have, as well as data that currently exists in the landscape, and so I've gone to researchers working at NEON sites, but non-NEON data, and asked them to contribute their data to these efforts um, with moderate success, I would say. Um, but there is an ongoing challenge between the location of NEON sites, as well as the researchers who are currently at those NEON sites, and trying to bring all those pieces of data together. And I really see that as a place where, where NEON can help us um, in, in organizing this challenge. Um, a little bit more about connecting field and airborne data. I saw in, uh, in the participants there that Sarah is here. So great work to our annotator, Sarah Anacleto, um, because it's a very difficult task, right? You have all of these points. And so you try to look how big they are, how, um, how their species representation might help us understand which points go with which pixels, try to draw their crowns by hand. This is one that Sarah had done and try to figure out, okay, we think those stems are those pixels assigned to those boxes, so the, those boxes get that label. Um, it's a very difficult and laborious task. Sarah has done thousands of these um, and deserves a tremendous amount of credit, um, but frankly, there are tens of thousands more to do. Um, and so if you're interested in these data, we'd be happy to share them with you, um, but it's an ongoing challenge in how to pair machine learning with this um, kind of uh, uncertain ground truth data. Um, I will say that I don't have a timer out in front of me. Uh, Bridget or, or or Sam, can you throw me a time estimate? I can't see the time through Zoom. Yeah, you're at 23 minutes after the hour, so tons of time. Awesome. You could go for 20 more minutes if you'd like. Or ever, yeah, whatever. yeah, that's that's perfect. I just want to make sure I can't. Sometimes Zoom's got the little clock and I can't see it. Um, so I won't go too deeply into the uh, neural network architecture here, but I want to highlight a couple. And just real quick, I think you, you stop sharing your slides. Uh, or somehow that. Oh no, somehow. I can I can see them. Oh, I think we were fine. I can see them. Let's do it again. How about now? Oh, it looks great to me. Looks, looks good to me. Yeah, maybe it's just right. me. Thanks. Um, I won't go too deep into the neural network architecture. Um, and uh, what it is that uh underlies a lot of the the progress here. But I want to highlight three key themes. One, we have a hierarchical structure. So first thing we ask is, you know, for this site in Florida, for example, is it the most common species? Yes or no? Okay, is it a broadleaf or needleleaf species? Yes or no? Is it an oak or non-oak species? And we have this sort of hierarchical neural network um, that's called a mixture of experts. And that helps us deal with class imbalance because uh, our most common species, for example, at a site could be, uh, you know, 5,000 times more common uh, in the training data. And certainly, you know, hundreds of thousands of times more common in the prediction data um, than our rarest species. And so we have a tremendous amount of class imbalance. And so hierarchical organization has been really important for class imbalance. We use uh, multiple years of hyperspectral data ensembled together. Uh, the nature of the ensembling uh, is still quite uh, immature. We literally average them. Um, and I think there more work could be done there. And we use these sort of spectral attention blocks to try to figure out which neon uh, hyperspectral bands are most appropriate. And so those are the three innovations, I won't go too deep here, that I think are worth knowing for other types of remote sensing. Hierarchical organization, multi-temporal ensembling, and attention blocks. I think those are three key takeaways here. Um, and I can talk more about that if people are interested. Um, I, I won't go too much into the detail here, but that was just sort of trying to, to underlie the different pieces here. But Multi-temporal is really, uh, really important. We're not very good at augmenting hyperspectral imagery to generate uh, reasonable hyperspectral uh, uh, data augmentations. And so multi-temporal really helps us get a sense of the variability um, in the spectral representations. What the end result looks like um, for any given site is, is, is this. So this is, for example, BART. Um, I think this is 5.5 million trees. 
Um, and so you can zoom in on any given location and each of them have a species prediction um, and a uh, sort of local structure. I call this sort of the meso structure and here's like the landscape structure. In some ways, um, the emergence of artificial intelligence for remote sensing and computer vision um, asks new ecological questions. And so we haven't had data at this level of, of detail at these different structures in the past. And so understanding the ecological processes that happen across scale, I think is really interesting and not something that personally I have time to work on, um, but these data are out there and open source, they're on Zenodo. And if you are a landscape ecologist here and interested in the species distributions at different scaling levels, um, these data maps are, are really interesting. And you see a lot of emergent patterns that I think I'll show in a second as well. Um, and so some sites, uh, we have tremendous local diversity and some sites we have uh, broad scale patterns. Um, and so I wanna show a couple of these tree species maps because I think they're really fascinating. And frankly, um, there's a lot to learn here that we don't have time to explore and we welcome others um, to, to, to take a shot at. And so one of the things that interests me that I've noticed, but again, have not done anything with is the level of admixture at these different spatial scales. And so here um, at CERC, for example, that looks nearly Poisson to me. That looks like a almost completely random distribution um, from these macroecological levels. Same thing at Harvard Forest. Um, but then you see more structure um, at CLBJ or really, really strongly structured at the Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, and so these different uh, ecological structures we see um, I think are really interesting and underline both the biotic and abiotic drivers of species distributions at these different levels um, that I think are worth studying um, from a forestry standpoint. Um, I was meeting with some foresters at Oregon State the other day um, and really trying to say that there's some really cool things happening here um, that my lab does not have time to, to investigate. But I think there's a lot going on here in terms of um, the different scales of species distributions. I also think they're very beautiful to stare at and, and I, I spend too much time looking at them um, and I urge you to, to waste some time looking at them because it's really cool to look at um, biodiversity at this kind of level. Um, we have a web server, should you want to see it? Um, and uh, I was gonna do a quick show of it. Uh, everything's still good, Bridget, we can still see me. Yep, thanks. Cool. Um, so this is the web server. We can go through and pull down different sites. Um, if anyone has a favorite site out here, throw it in the chat. Um, uh, let's look at, uh, uh, let's say Teak. I like Teak. Teak's interesting. Teak Kettle Canyon. Um, we can zoom all the way in. Credit to Ethan White for a lot of work on this visualization. It takes a second to render, so give it a second. Boom. There it goes. Hopefully that rendered for you guys. Um, and for uh, any given box, right, we have an alive dead, we have a species score, we have its location. Um, and so we can zoom through and look at them. And we can see that segmentations are not perfect. We we do not claim and are not naive enough to believe that every segmentation here is perfect or that every species prediction is perfect. Um, but instead of thinking about comparing this to human ability, you know, a lot of times foresters think about this as terms of a, a proxy for 40 meter plots. And I wouldn't think about it that way. It's a tool to help you understand the distribution and abundance of organisms at a scale that humans cannot verify, right? And so um, it's not important really what human performance is at the 100 million uh, individual scale because people can't count 100 million trees. And so thinking about this in terms of, okay, are we replacing foresters at 40 meter plots? No, that's not the goal here. The goal is to provide a, a level of information that accompanies traditional forestry or traditional biodiversity metrics. Um, and in the same way, we are not going to be completely accurate. It also provides us a sense of um, the scale of the challenge ahead of us, right? There's a huge number of trees here. And if you zoom in on any one of, one of them, of course, there's a chance that they are not correct. But it's an aggregate that we think we have a lot of value in measuring biodiversity, uh, carbon processes, ecosystem function. And so I urge you to go, um, I, I don't know if all of you go one time, will the server hold that? Maybe don't all of you go, but uh, we find out. Let's see if we crash the thing. Um, I, what happens when everyone goes to visualize the trees.org? And you can roll through, it takes a second to render for all the boxes. Um, and uh, these are some really cool putative locations. Let's go back to the talk. 
So now that we have putative locations of individual trees within neon sites, that opens up a whole realm of really cool science that I'm really excited about. Um, and that I think has a tremendous value in, in taking this further, right? So it's easy to collect data on the really common species. We know where they are, right? What's much harder is finding the rare ones. But now that we have rare uh, predictions, let's say our ninth or 10th most common that are in our models, we could send people to them to collect new data, to improve that model, to make a new set of data, right? And continue this active learning loop. But it's an active learning loop that involves field researchers. Often in computer vision, we talk about active learning as, hey, you have a huge amount of data that's already collected. Which one should we annotate next? What we're talking about is field verification and field active learning, right? And not only that, we can take it a step further because not only can we send people to individual tree locations, we can also send uh, high resolution imagery to those locations through drones, right? And so one of the things that I'm really excited about is, is the potential for using multiple types of aircraft um, to verify some of these predictions. So imagine you have this landscape and you're looking for a specific magnolia. It's your 11th most common tree species. It's very hard to find. It's in some swampy area that's difficult to get to and send uh, field researchers to, right? And we have know, 200 predicted of them. Can we pr program into a drone uh, the locations of those uh, crowns, send a drone to each of them, have it drop towards the canopy, take high resolution imagery of that particular crown, and then have a human verify uh, whether those uh, crowns are correct or not. And I see this as the future and the only way we're going to escape the, the challenge of human uh, data collection in these massive landscapes. We need to include automation. If there are drone pilots here, if there are people really interested in remote sensing, I would love to talk to you about how mission planning works here and choosing uh, the right uh, trees to sample, right? It's a very difficult optimization problem um, and sort of traveling salesman thing going on. And so we need to think about the next generation of these tools is directly integrated into field sampling. Um, and the same thing could be true for uh, uh, open set classification for, for trees that are not currently in the model. The drone could look for spectral representations um, that are uh, unusual. And so you can imagine that this kind of collaboration between engineering, artificial intelligence, and biology um, really will help us transform our ability to collect data rapidly um, at, at, at large scales. And it's something I would really like to be part of. Um, and please you know, get in touch if you're interested in, in talking about this further. This is what some of the imagery looks like. We've had a little bit of, of uh, test flights here. Um, Stephanie Bullman um, at, and Eben Broadbent at, at UF have started to play in this space a little bit and think about, okay, what is it that we can do? And so um, Eben went out with Stephanie and flew over some crowns and uh, tried to get high resolution imagery um, from the drone, right? This is a resolution that Neon can't get because it's covering 5 million trees. But now that we have putative crowns, you can go out to, to all the carrier, for example, and say, okay, I can get this kind of data. And for the botanists in the room, it's a really interesting question because all the field guides we've ever had about trees, for example, think about the human representation as from the ground point of view. But now we're talking about the airborne point of view. What percentage of trees can be identified from the airborne perspective? We need field guides that imagine a new set of perspectives, not just about, you know, what does the bark look like or what does the tree presentation look like from below, but what does it look like from above? And so starting to catalog what trees are possible to identify from high resolution drone imagery um, when we are really close to it, I think is a really big question um, because there's 160 some tree species we want to identify in the neon data and we're only at 80 some. And so to collect that next 80 or 90 species that are really rare, we need to think in, a, in, in an innovative way. And I think there's a, a lot of power here for targeted drone sampling to accompany neon's um, broad scale sampling. The last thing I'll say is that there's a reason this is difficult. Um, there's a really nice paper by Nico Lang, uh, who I respect deeply in computer vision showing that um, you know, mining classes, looking for classes that are very similar to things that you already know about uh, is really hard. So imagine we have some oak species that we think it occurs in the landscape, but it's very similar to another oak species, which we know occurs in the landscape. Trying to piece out those spectral representations is difficult. Um, and I, I, I highly suggest this paper um, by, by, uh, by Lang and collaborators looking at open set recognition and species classification. Um, they use iNaturalist data, um, so it's a much more constrained kind of problem. But frankly, the same kind of challenges are even more uh, pertinent in trees. And so if there's a 
a uh, machine learning researcher here who's interested in very hard and novel questions on open set classification and fine grain uh, systems uh, for airborne uh, monitoring. Uh, there's some cool data out there that I think uh, could really speak to some really interesting and novel questions. I'm not going to belabor this too much, um, but I wanted to provide a couple uh, sort of machine learning for ecology overview ideas um, for those of you who are doing applied machine learning projects here. Um, and this is sort of what I usually tell students. I'm giving a talk um, at Colorado next week on sort of like in the trenches machine learning development for ecology. And I think these are some of the, the really important takeaways. Um, we have learned over and over again that data is the thing that drives performance. Um, you know, there are a million machine learning architectures, transformers, all sorts of new things coming out every week. You can spend an endless amount of time chasing architecture, <clears throat> but data is forever. And so uh, we really focus on data quality and 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 data over architectures. Um, and it's not to say that architectures don't matter. Of course they matter. But if you don't have the data, you won't be able to reach your maximum performance. Um, that's really important for everyone to understand. Um, there's a lot of hype around architecture, but data really fundamental. Um, Multi-view ensembling continues to be really powerful, um, even if you just average your views. And so if you take a drone flight and you go out the next day and take another drone flight and average them together, you're going to get better performance. Um, in Neon's case, we take multi-years of data, um, and it's actually really helpful in that regard. Um, evaluation on within data set performance gives limited insight. We see a lot of papers in, in, in both Neon publications as well as non-Neon publications. Um, I mean, people who are using Neon data um, that are focused on the evaluation number as the fundamental measure of success. Uh, we need to be very careful because it's a lot of ways to play with that evaluation rigor. And so uh, we see a, an epidemic, if you will, of 90, 95% accuracy in machine learning papers. Um, and that just doesn't, that doesn't jive with our lived experience. Um, difficult ecological problems are somewhere between 60 and 75% accurate right now. Um, and then you have to iterate from there in a grinding kind of way. If you're getting 95% accuracy on your problem, you've set up the problem in a way that's either too easy or not reflecting the true challenge. Um, that's in general what we're seeing. Um, and class imbalance uh, you know, is one of the oldest challenges we have in machine learning for ecology. Um, and it remains probably the dominant challenge in collecting data and getting the classes. Every time you collect a, a, a sample of your most common tree, um, you're making your model work harder to find the rarer things. Um, it's natural to go out to landscape and just collect all the data you can, but you end up undersampling your common classes anyway. So be really careful about the efficiency of data collection. Um, and I, I wanna really highlight, I think the last one here, um, which is annotation detail. Um, a lot of criticism of deep forest comes from the bounding box versus polygon idea. Um, and I think it's really important for everyone to understand that annotation is expensive and logistically difficult. And so annotating boxes versus polygons versus the, the model benefit of those differences needs to be taken into account. Um, and so we really think carefully about not just annotating for greater detail when we can, but rather what's the most efficient way to annotate the imagery I need. Um, and I think with that, I'm going to throw a couple of just sort of other pieces here that I think is um, common for these kind of talks when I give, people always ask me, have we thought about? Um, and I wanna just provide what I call intuitions, um, but we don't know the answers to a lot of these questions. Um, Multi-sensor fusion across Neon data products is still very difficult um, and not to be done trivially. It is not as simple as slapping the canopy height model on top of the RGB data and getting better tree segmentations. Um, we have no evidence, for example, that the low point density LIDAR, um, especially before 2023, improves RGB segmentation. Um, it's natural to think that it would. It's very reasonable to think that in the future it could. We just currently have no evidence that it does. Um, the same thing for high resolution spatial RGB data and improving spectral classifications. You would think that the one meter uh, hyperspec would be improved by the 10 centimeter RGB. Um, we have no evidence that that's true either. Now, again, I would believe it if someone proved it to me, but we've not seen it and a lot of people have tried. Uh, the same thing about ensembling across years. Uh, it's natural to think, okay, trees don't move that much. Let's take 2018, 2019, 2023 and try to ensemble the segmentations together. Um, this is difficult because the trees could change, but they don't always change. And so some sort of soft limit is, is interesting there. So if there's any machine learning researchers here who want to take an interesting stab at a problem, um, these are intuitions 
that I think could be overcome, but currently we have no evidence um, for them, even though it seems seems reasonable. Um, I'm gonna, I think, end with just a, a couple pieces because this is a NEON seminar and thinking about NEON itself. Um, what have we learned using NEON data? Uh, I would say foremost that accessing NEON data is hard. Uh, I have become a de facto data source for NEON airborne data rather than the portal. Uh, I would say that I get two or three requests a month to just give people a lot of airborne data because they are they can't figure out how to use the portal to download the kind of data they want. They can't figure out the, the speed of the download. Um, and so we have become a kind of conduit for NEON airborne data. And so uh, I know there's a tremendous amount to do um, at the portal and it's very hard, but I think it's worth underlying that it continues to be very difficult for uh, researchers to understand what's in the portal and where things go and where to get data. Um, we have ended up being a kind of data repository source outside of the portal. Um, that's very common for people to email us and be like, I couldn't figure out the portal. Can you give me this thing? I'm looking for that. Um, the between year airborne uh, imagery is very strong because of the way in which the LIDAR um, uh, underpins the georeferencing of the RGB data. We see really good between year consistency in the georeferencing. Um, that does come at the cost of artifacts within the RGB data. We see quite a bit of swirling um, in the RGB data. It's not nearly as bad as it was in 2018 or 2019. Um, so, so a lot of credit goes to the airborne team. Um, We've seen a lot of high quality terrestrial geolocation. Uh, and so uh, people always ask like, you know, how accurate are those points with respect to the crowns? And our answer is that of all the things to worry about, the terrestrial geolocation is not one of them. Um, pairing the airborne and terrestrial data in a three-dimensional way is still really hard. Uh, there has been some recent work in trying to work on uh, the hyperspectral calibration and reflectance. Uh, our initial experience with this is that generalization across hyperspectral lines is very weak. Uh, you can take a red maple in uh, BART and try to predict a red maple in Florida, and you'll see that they have completely different spectral representations. And we don't know if that's the ecology, you know, treat, treat, leaf trait evolution, or if that's uh, environmental differences or the calibration differences. But the current state of play is that generalizing across hyperspectral um, collections is still really, really hard um, and needs a lot more work. Um, the last thing I will say uh, that I think is uh, an under um, sort of predicted part of this is that neon data can be really useful for non-neon sites. And I see this as the future, um, not just thinking about, okay, what are the 42 sites and how do we improve uh, the data at those 42 sites, but thinking about how we use the backbones we've developed at neon for non-neon locations. And so, for example, for the hyperspectral data, you know, we have 369 band uh, hyperspectral data that we use. Um, how do we use that? and help people who have 10 band data collected from drones at some other site. Um, we wanna be able to transform across data alignments and manifold alignments um, for hyperspectral species classification. And so if there's, again, people interested in talking about this, I'm happy to, to discuss further. But I see this as, as sort of the next step is both the multi-temporal work, as well as the transforming from neon to non-neon sites. And with that, I think I'll take questions and I love a, a, a bit of chat. Um, again, I don't have the timer in front of me, so I wasn't sure how long I actually took. That was perfect, Ben. That's at uh, 45 minutes. So there you thank go. You, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. That was an excellent talk. Um, Neon has, I'll, I'll turn my video on. So Neon's been thinking a lot about AI readiness and how to make our data more AI ready. So this was super relevant, especially for me, and I'm sure a ton of us here at Neon in that regard. Um, we do have a number of questions that came in, so I'll just start going through those. Um, and if anyone would like to ask in person instead of me reading your question, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. So I'll start. Um, we have a number, we have a couple questions from Anna Spears that came in. So a quick question, does deep forest consider other woody plants aside from trees, like shrubs, for example, or just trees? Well, that's a very interesting very way to cut to the heart of it. So one <laughs> of the challenges we've had, um, uh, I know you want to turn your video on or I can't see you, but um, one of the challenges we've had, right, is that um, a taxonomic definition of tree is, is a little hard to come by for all these 42 sites. And frankly, as we go to million trees and we go around the world, um, what a tree is, uh, is very difficult to pin down. And so what we've done for NEON uh, is it's three meters uh, in the LIDAR canopy height model. So it has to be a woody vegetation structure data product 
and it has to be at least three meters. Um, that's not going to cut it when we don't have LIDAR data. Um, and it's actually something that uh, World Resources Institute has asked us about, um, especially when you think about some of the landscapes uh, in, in savanna ecosystems, what a tree is is still quite hard. Um, but our formal definition for neon is three meters um, in the LIDAR canopy, canopy height model. OK, thank you. And she had another question. Um... How have you thought, th thought through remote sensing data quality versus accessibility? In particular, I'm wondering if you're using NEON's tiled data products versus using the raw flight lines and applying BRDF for topographic flight line corrections. Yeah, so this is interesting. One of the things that we have learned uh, about, this should go under the slide, things we think to be true, but don't know to be true. Uh, we have not seen any increased value in using BRDF or any kind of calibration versus allowing the neural network to learn those calibrations uh, itself in the manifold alignment. And so uh, it's natural to think that that wouldn't be true, that pre-calibrating using uh, the flight information would be useful. Uh, we have no evidence that that's true. And every paper I've seen that's shown that, um, frankly, has not been aggressive enough in testing the alternatives for me to believe it. Um, and so we did spend a tremendous amount of time looking at different normalizations um, in the raw data products. And we simply have no evidence that it's better. Um, and I know uh, more recently, uh, there has been work at NEON to apply BRDF directly to new data products. In fact, it's a new hyperspectral data product number. The number escapes me for just a second. Um, but we have not tried that one versus the old one to see, um, but our own personal BRDF corrections, which Sergio Marconi worked on for a long time, um, we just don't see the evidence for that kind of generalization, um, which is frustrating, but uh, I think is an area of, of ongoing need. Thank you. Yeah, I'll drop a link to that new data product. It did just come online this year. It's revision two of the same data product ID, but thanks, Ben. Okay, so Sony, uh, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but Gimir asks, any idea if we can learn microbial processes like respiration or enzyme activities and so on using remote sensing data? Yeah, so this is one of those interesting pieces, right, where there is a lot of desire for trait information, not only leaf processes, but of course, carbon processes um, that are happening within uh, individual trees. Uh, and I would urge uh, everyone here to pull down some spectral data go collect tree information and traits and try to map this together because it's a really unknown space. What kind of, what are the mechanisms underlying leaf trait spectra, right? Uh, we know that the protein structure is part of this and we know that health status is part of this. Dan Johnson and collaborators um, have at forest geosites within neon uh, locations have looked at this as well. Um, and I urge you to, to contact them and think about this stuff. Um, uh, Townsend's lab at, at the University of Wisconsin as well. Um, we, I don't think, have a perfect grasp under the mechanisms underlying leaf trait spectra and what are driving the, the representations we see. It's extremely possible that other kinds of enzyme activities uh, underlie the, the kind of individual peaks. You know, the holy grail is to have something like the um, the way that the Mars or other outer Earth observation teams do, where you can map individual peaks to specific responses. Um, I'm always very jealous when you talk to the NASA people and they're like, oh, that's the, the particular hydrogen peak. And we know specifically about that and that particular spectra representation. And they have a very clear mechanistic understanding um, for the spectra and those uh, processes. We lack that in traits. Um, and I think that uh, greater work between botanists and remote sensors is is really fruitful and important there. Thank you. Okay, we have another question from Kelsey Hulsman. She says, I may have missed this detail, but did you generate the tree species classification training set using the neon hyperspectral data pixels within the label canopies? If a species was included in the training data set, is it confident is its confidence a hundred percent or is it also assigned a confidence value based on the model? So um and there's a couple pieces here. Because of the three-dimensional structure of forests, there's nothing close to 100% confident, even with ground truth data. Uh, the machine learning scientist who works with us, Dr. Lena Zare, coined the phrase, which I really like, 
which is what we don't call them ground truth data. We call them ground truth rumors. Um, and I like that much better because I think it represents the kind of challenge we have um, because you can't tell that an individual pixel goes with individual leaf spectra. Um, everything is in this space of uncertain. And so the traditional data cleaning met metrics you might use, um, for example, it's very common to have like a clean data set and like a larger dirty data set and then use the clean data set to try to verify the dirtier one. We don't have clean, right? We only have dirty. It infects both test and train. And so everything underlying this always has to be understood that we will need more data than others because some of that data, you oh, I think it's a black tupelo, but actually there's another tree coming across the side of it and that's a cedar and now they've been polluted together. And so this kind of um, mixture challenge is really, really key. Um, and we killed a lot of time last spring in automatic data cleaning methods that didn't go anywhere, but I think are really cool and I'd be happy to talk about. Thanks. Uh, we still have a few more questions. So Rachel Swanson asks, neon AOP flies during peak green. If there was an unlimited budget, is there another time of year that you think would add the most information? Yeah, no, this is interesting. I think it goes back to the traits question, right? Uh, what does NEON want to do in terms of the kinds of um, ecological sciences it wants to support the ecosystem services, wants to support? You know, uh, from a species classification perspective, late fall is really interesting from phenology. And I hear this from a lot from, from, from people studying conifers or the cones make it a lot of big difference in the spectral representation. I heard that just yesterday from some scientists at Oregon State. And so I think late fall is valuable there. But frankly, uh, for the like woody vegetation mass people, uh, dead of winter would be interesting as well, right? To be able to get the branching patterns and the amount of biomass. Um, and so there's a there's an optimization problem here about what NEON wants to support. And it's always been a challenge at NEON, right? Is that you have this open data set and all these varied uses and how to, to support the, the different use cases here. Um, from a purely selfish perspective, uh, more airborne data is not going to help us. From a purely selfish perspective, Sending people out to non-neon plots, right? To not to not the not the set plots and trying to find the rarer species, um, or even just not repeat sampling the terrestrial plots, but just doing the other quarters of them um, would be hugely helpful versus resampling a tree species we already know. But that's entirely selfish. Thank you. Okay, Ethan Buschultz asks if we had drone-derived lidar data for a given area with low or limited ground data, would deep forests be able to reasonably identify tree species? And then a second question is how much, uh, how much supervision is needed to take these tools and apply them for investigations on the landscape? Yeah, I mean, the art, deep forest works on RGB, I should say, right? The LIDAR is just to underlie the pre-training, um, but there are LIDAR algorithms out there. And frankly, you could train a LIDAR algorithm from the RGB representations just in reverse of what we've done. Um, I would say that uh, the greatest challenge there is trying to figure out how to represent the spectral data. Um, what I was sort of hinting at at the last couple slides is that species classification is just so much easier in the hyperspec. And the hyperspec is really, really tied to individual calibration and individual systems, right? The machine learning model has no sense that we're in some sort of nanometer infrared range and it's a numpy array it's a it has no sense it's 369 numbers and so when you go and have a 10 band hyperspectral drone based sensor how to take our data that we've collected and apply it to that new sensor is a huge effort um and i think that that's a whole research program um that we don't have time to take on right now but i think is is something massive for uh neon as well as transferring outside of neon sites or just making neon data better but within the spec of other sensors, right? Because right now we are very much in a jail of the hyperspectral AOP platform. We cannot just easily cross-reference to another platform um, with a new band number and a new band width. All right, this next question kind of feeds into that. So John Musinski asks, awesome, pres or he says awesome presentation. And then he asks, yes, <laughs> what are your thoughts on opportunities and challenging and, and challenges in scaling up your approach to continental mapping using satellite hyperspectral sensors that are now just coming online from NASA and planet? That's like the SVG satellite. Yeah. So, so, you know, this is the conversation we're having with World Resources Institute um, as well through the Million Trees Project. Um, 
I will confess that I am not a particularly strong proponent of satellite-based observation for tree delineate. I don't think it's yet possible. Now, it's not that it won't be possible in the future, but I want the number and the generalization from 10 centimeter data to be so much higher than it is before I'm interested in what happens at 40 or 50 or 60 centimeter data. Um, I understand the conservation and ecological need to move to those broad scale sensors and we should try it, but uh, it is difficult to make that leap if we haven't really ironed out what happens in drones and 10 centimeter data before you get to, you know, we've we've talked to planet, I have downloaded planet tiles and run deep forest on them. It works, but how would you really know? Because it's difficult to know the clusters. And so yes, you'll get a result. And yes, that result will be informative. And I guess by my same logic of, it doesn't matter what a human can do at hundred million trees. It doesn't matter what a human could do at 3 trillion trees because it's something, it provides us some level of interest and some level of, of information. At some point, it becomes divorce enough from ground truth that we don't know what we can do. Um, the same thing is true with the spectral representations. Um, we see enough admixture at the local level that the pixels would have to be pretty small. And again, even one meter neon pixels are pretty big. Um, and so uh, it's not that I don't think there's importance here and that people should be working on it. People absolutely should. but. I would like to see a kind of curriculum learning approach wherein we get really good at drones, we get really good at manned aircraft, and then, then we take on satellite. Um, but perhaps the ecological and conservation need is just too great for us to play that slow, long game. Great, thanks. And then uh, a last question from Dave Durden. He asks, for the camp canopy sampling protocol, we are collecting samples from a wide range of species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, We occasionally take ASD measurements of the samples. Do you feel that this data would help to train the model at all? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with ASD. Was that oh, for? so? It's hand a handheld spectrometer. So yeah. So this getting... is a good question. I, the hand spectra. Um, I have been told by remote sensors that this is very difficult to make into a uh, convincing spectra from the atmosphere corrections. So from the 10 centimeter or one meter hy hyperspectral data, um, I would love to see more work on this. I do not have the skill set to take that on, but if there is a hyperspectral data scientist here who wants to understand it better, connecting the leaf spectra to the atmospheric representation of that spectra from uh, the one meter hyperspectral data would be fascinating. I have been told it's non-trivial. That's all I've been told. I've never attempted it, but talking to uh, my colleagues at NASA, uh, it's not like you just take the data and course in it and have this representation of what the uh, spectra would be if it was in one meter data. Um, there's more complexity to it than that, but uh, I think the data can't be you know, overlooked and I think every source of data is important. Uh, I hope that that's something we can use. Um, it's not something we've used so far. Thank you. Okay, we're just about out of time. So um, I'll just give a plug. We have another talk coming up next month on um, environmental and bi biological controls of water use diversity across US ecosystems. That's by Gabriel Bre Bowen. And Samantha dropped a link there. Thank you so much, Ben. That was a, a yeah, fascinating and, talk. And I, I really actually want to thank you guys as well. I know it's a tremendous amount of work at NEON. I see Tristan is here um, and, and all of the work that the AOP team does. Um, I know it's a huge effort. Um, and so I want to thank Neon for all of the work they've done in the last few years. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on and I get that. Great. Well, have a great rest of your day. Goodbye, everybody. Um, I'm happy to talk offline, email, GitHub. Thanks, guys. <laughs>